Excuse me. So thank you, Rick, for joining us tonight. We're really excited to learn more about the history um, and genetics of white-tailed deer in Nantucket. So without further ado, to go ahead. Okay, then. So um, let me share my screen and let's get started here. I want this. Okay, so if I've done this right, you should in fact see a slide that says history and genetics, white-tailed deer on Nantucket Island. Um, so, uh, first of all, let me explain a little bit about myself and how I got into this in the first place. I am not a wildlife biologist. I'm not um, an expert on deer. I am a marine biologist by training and an evolutionary biologist. Uh, I study um, genetics of, of wild populations. I, I do population genetics. Uh, I started out by looking at various kinds of um, marine fishes and invertebrates to that for a long time. But uh, there are some other questions that I've fallen into over the years that aren't really directly related to marine biology. And this DEER project is one of them. Um, this started a few years ago when uh, another professor in my department, Dr. Brian Connolly, um, said to me, did you know that all the deer on Nantucket are descended from just three deer. I said, I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about Nantucket deer at all. Um, he said, wouldn't that be an interesting genetic project to look at? And I thought, sure it would. That sounds like fun. And could I go to Nantucket to do it? Which also sounded like fun. And so that's kind of where this got started. And this was back, I guess, 2016. And uh, oh, went to Nantucket with uh, uh, extensive help of, of, of Dr. Sarah Boyce from the Linda Learning Foundation who made this thing all possible as well. And so here is kind of what I know about white-tailed deer, but make it real clear, um, I, I am coming at this from the perspective of an evolutionary biologist and a geneticist, not a wildlife biologist or um, uh, a deer biologist or anything like that. So let's see um, if this works like that. All right, so white-tailed deer, as you may or may not know, are one of the most widespread large mammals um, in North America. Uh, the, the species, Otocoilus virginianus, is widespread across North America and South America. There are a lot of different subspecies, although the distinctions between them aren't all that clear, but for what it's worth, the subspecies that's present in the northeastern part of North America, where we are, is um, a subspecies called Borealis. And you can see from this map just how widespread white-tailed deer are. It's interesting, the little uh, patch of um, white here is actually the range of a closely related species called the mule deer. They're in fact so closely related that they will actually hybridize sometimes. Okay, now deer were restricted during the last ice age as the, this, this map shows the extent of the continental glaciers at the peak of the last ice age. And you can see that the glaciated area extended well into the middle part of the United States. And as you probably know, this part of North America was under a ice sheet for thousands of years. So no deer around here during the last ice age. They were all living in what were called refuges, uh, refugia, south of the extent of the glaciers. And then as the ice age melts, um, the deer move further north into uh, these newly available parts of North America. Um, in pre-colonial times, there were large populations of white-tailed deer throughout most of North America. But when Europeans uh, settle, uh, they hunt these deer very aggressively. And uh, by the 17 and 1800s, they'd been hunted to very low numbers in many parts of the country. And then in the 1900s, um, there was extensive efforts to restock uh, deer in those areas where they had been um, extirpated. And so white-tailed deer were moved around, brought from areas where there were existing herds and brought into new areas to establish herds. And so the 
relationships of deer in North America are really confusing, uh, especially because deer were brought into areas quite far away from uh, where the source populations were. So it's really hard to figure out which deer are related to, to which anymore. Okay, now the story on Nantucket is this, that all the deer are descended from just three deer who were brought to the island in the 1920s. This is the story that you can read in this book, Hidden History of Nantucket. And uh, what it says is this, that deer were present on the island in pre-colonial times. There are deer remains found in, in Indian middens on the island. So there were deer here before, but they were all hunted out. And newspaper reports from the early 1900s mentioned that there are no deer on the island. And then uh, in 1922, uh, a, a fisherman in Nantucket Sound uh, found this male deer swimming in the sound and, and rescued him and brought him to the island and let him go. And for several years, he was the only deer on the island and uh, he was treated as kind of like a pet. People would see him occasionally wandering around and they kind of felt sorry for him. And so some residents of the island purchased two female deer from a deer farm in Michigan, had them shipped out by rail and released um, on the island in 1926 to keep a company. And so here we have that incident um, of Buck meeting his two new friends. So what happened after that is that uh, the herd started to grow from that one male and two females. Uh, the herd increased, but as the herd was growing, there were some later additions, and these are not usually told in the story. This, this was not part of the story I was told. I didn't learn this until I'd been thinking about these deer for several years and started doing some uh, historical research of my own. But in 1935, two more male deer were brought to the island from New Hampshire. And in 1936, three female deer brought to the island from New Hampshire. And the, stated purpose of this was to improve the herd for hunting and to reduce inbreeding. So um, a small number of founders for this population, but not three, maybe eight. So in the 1930s, this herd is doing quite well. It was estimated that there were as many as 400 deer on the island in 1936 which is pretty rapid growth rate from three to several hundred in, in, uh, in a decade. But this has been documented for other deer herds in other parts of the world where they have abundant food and no predators and no real competitors. And clearly in this early part of this history, um, at least some people were rather fond of these deer. This is an editorial from the Nantucket Inquirer and in Miriam in 1936, that talks about how proud the islanders are of their island and how anyone who would dare molest or shoot one of the deer would be condemned by the entire community. So that's uh, the early history of these deer. Now, today, there are a lot of deer on Nantucket. There are between two and 3,000 deer on Nantucket. Estimated population density is 40 to 50 deer per square mile. This is one of the densest populations in the Northeast. So deer are very, very successful on the island. But deer, um, as they interact with humans, have um, some consequences. Here, for example, is just a picture of some deer eating somebody's lawn. And they also eat your ornamental plants and things like that. But perhaps more importantly, they're a host for deer ticks, which are the, um, the vector for um, Lyme disease. And there is, in fact, a high incidence of Lyme disease on the island. Also other tick-borne diseases like babesiosis and anaplasmosis. So the deer are cute, but they are, if you will, a mixed blessing. Okay, so 
I came into this to answer the question, well, is this story true? Are all these deer descended from a relatively small number of founders? Not three, perhaps, but eight. And because I'm a population geneticist, I can approach this from a genetic perspective. There are uh, clear genetic consequences to founding a population with a small number of individuals. This is what's called the founder effect. Now, in, in my lab, I use a technique uh, that studies mitochondrial DNA. And mitochondrial DNA has some advantages for a study like this because it is inherited only from the mother. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But because of this maternal inheritance, uh, you can make some very clear predictions. If there were five founding females, two from Michigan and three from New Hampshire, that means there could be at most five distinct mitochondrial DNA sequences on the island. We call these haplotypes. But more than that, the earliest haplotypes from those two females from Michigan should be the most frequent because the herd already numbered several hundred by the time those deer from New Hampshire were brought in. So that leads to these really very clear predictions of what the herd should look like in, in the sense of its mitochondrial DNA sequence variation. So my goal for this was to provide research projects for my undergraduate students. I teach at Framingham State University. Framingham State is an undergraduate institution. We don't have a big graduate program, um, but every student in the biology department at Framingham State has to complete a research project. And so I felt this would be a good research project for our students to do. Um, we started out, went to, uh, to collect samples from Nantucket. And actually the first year we went to collect, we went, uh, with, with Dr. Boyce from the Linda Noring Foundation, we went out and collected um, deer feces. That's an illustration of deer feces if you've never seen one before. Um, but we also um, collect. We also were donated some some muscle tissue samples by local hunters. So that was the start of this project. But since then, um, to expand it, I was able to get um, additional samples from. Uh, other parts of the of the area, um, I had a former student who was actually running one of the hunter check stations in, on Cape Cod, and so he collected a bunch of tissue samples from me. And we got donations from hunters and wildlife agencies in Michigan and New York and Connecticut, as well as uh, other parts of New England. So this is the material that I have to study a number of samples from Nantucket, a number of samples from um, other areas in the Northeast to compare them, and then some samples from Michigan, which is at least um, historically what's supposed to be the, the source of the females that founded this herd. Okay, and the goals of this project are first of all, to look at genetic diversity on Nantucket. Um, is there evidence? Can we identify the source population? Can we identify the results of this founder effect, the idea that a small number of individuals founded this herd? And then can we look for the effects of inbreeding, which is in fact often a problem when you have a population that was started by a small number of individuals, there are only close relatives um, and that can lead to some genetic problems. And then, what I also wanted to do was to compare the deer on Nantucket to deer in other parts of New England. No one has actually published any studies on white-tailed deer in New England. There have been lots of studies on white-tailed deer in other parts of North America. So I thought that would be an interesting comparison as well. How do deer in New England look compared to the rest of North America? And then how do deer on Nantucket look compared to the rest of deer in New England? Okay, and there are some broader implications as well. By looking at the genetics of these deer, you can um, get some idea of how much movement of animals there is within the region, how far do deer travel. 
uh, how similar are these deer from other parts of North America. And then when deer move, they carry their ticks with them, and that could be uh, spreading disease. Also, uh, deer carry another disease called chronic wasting disease. This is a, a prion disease. It's not spread by ticks. Um, it's found already in deer in upstate New York, but it hasn't been found in New England yet. And then um, very recently, it's turned out that white-tailed deer can be a reservoir for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is the virus that causes the COVID-19 pandemic that we're all still living with. It's been found in deer and other parts of North America, although not in New England yet. So knowing uh, the population genetics and being able to figure out the movement of deer has some, some other kind of even public health implications. Okay, so a little background. I'm going to go through this real fast. This is not going to be a real science heavy talk, but it is important to get a little bit of terminology straight. So these are diagrams of a DNA molecule and in particular showing that you can identify these nucleotides. There are four different kinds identified by these four letters, T, A, C, and G. And that a DNA molecule has a unique sequence, a sequence of these bases. And a unique sequence is called a haplotype. Two individuals that have exactly the same sequence have the same haplotype. And then um, different haplotypes, if they're fairly similar, can be put into what's called a haplogroup. And this is just a way of looking at how similar is the DNA from different individuals. But I'm going to use this word haplotype over and over again, so I wanted to make sure you knew what that meant. Now, mitochondrial DNA is unusual. Most of the DNA, as you perhaps remember from some high school class somewhere, is found in the nucleus of the cell. But the mitochondria are small little structures in cells called organelles, and they have their own separate DNA. It's separate from the nucleus and it's inherited separately. So um, just to make myself clear here, this is a kind of a diagram of a cell. Here is the nucleus where most of the DNA is. And here are a couple of little mitochondria found inside the cell. And then there is a DNA molecule found in this mitochondrion as well. And that's the DNA that I study. Mitochondrial DNA has this interesting maternal inheritance. So here is kind of how this works. Here is an egg, and here is the nuclear DNA in the egg, and the egg has a number of mitochondria in it with their own mitochondrial DNA. That's a sperm. The sperm has nuclear DNA in it, and it also has its own mitochondria. But when the sperm fertilizes the egg, the nuclear DNA from the sperm is deposited into the egg, but the mitochondria from the sperm get left outside. And so only mitochondria from the mother end up in the egg, maternal inheritance. What this means is that you can follow this pattern uh, from mothers to their offspring. I, I realize this image, which I took off the web. These are not deer. Um, but here is, for example, a female who is a carrier of some particular haplotype. And there's her mate. And then all of their offspring have that mitochondrial sequence, but only the female offspring can pass it on to the next generation. Male offspring can't. So maternal inheritance. So in order to look at differences among individuals in their DNA sequences, there had to be these differences. And these differences arise by mutations. Mutations change the sequence of the DNA. And it turns out that different regions of your DNA mutate at different rates. And in particular, mitochondrial DNA mutates maybe 10 times faster than nuclear DNA. Um, which is another reason why mitochondrial DNA is an attractive uh, part of the genome to look at. 
even within the mitochondrial DNA, different parts mutate at different rates. Those parts of the mitochondrial DNA that actually have information that produces proteins, what we call genes, they change very slowly because genes have to produce proteins that have to work. And so you can't change them too much. But there is one part of the mitochondrial DNA that doesn't have any genes. It's called the control region. And it mutates much faster than the rest of the mitochondrial DNA. So it's one of the fastest changing sequences. With the entire mitochondrial DNA genomes around 16,000 base pairs, the region that, that I studied, this control region, is about 700 base pairs. And so this one small piece of DNA is what we looked at. It's not all of the DNA, it's just this one little part of it. Okay, and even rapid mutations are really kind of slow. Any given base in a DNA sequence is expected to change maybe um, less than once per site per million years. What does that mean? That means in the 700 base pair region I'm looking at, I expect really only one change per thousand years, which means that the differences that I'm looking at didn't all happen recently. These all happened over the last many thousands of years and have been just kind of um, circulating in the population. Because remember, deer entered New England only 10, 15,000 years ago. So uh, not a lot of mutations since then. And uh, okay, now there's another way that DNA can mutate. And this, I apologize, this is a little confusing, but it becomes interesting, I hope, a little later on. Sometimes it's possible to duplicate a whole chunk of DNA. And deer, all white-tailed deer, have within their mitochondrial DNA a region which is copied twice. The same exact 75 base pair sequence occurs one right after the other, what's called a tandem repeat, like on a tandem bicycle. And so most deer have two copies of this tandem repeat, uh, although it's been found that a few deer in South Carolina and Georgia have three copies of this repeat. This is interesting because it turns out that some of the deer on Nantucket have, a three, have three copies of this repeat as well. And that was kind of unexpected. Okay, so how do we actually do this? Now, you perhaps may have heard of a technique called PCR. In fact, every one of you has probably gotten at least one PCR test to see whether or not you have coronavirus. It's the, the thing to do. But we're using the same methodology, this polymerase chain reaction, to look at the mitochondrial DNA sequence to try and look at um, differences among individuals. Um, each, in, each different sequence, each different haplotype then we identify as a result of this um, PCR reaction. And uh, the idea here is that all of the steps from collecting the samples, isolating the DNA, and preparing the DNA for sequencing has been done by my students, my undergraduate research students at Framingham State. So here's just a little bit about um, how PCR works. Uh, kind of goes like this, and I'm gonna go through this real fast again, but kind of like this. A DNA molecule is copied by this enzyme called DNA polymerase, and the rule is such that if you have a known sequence here, you get what's called the complementary sequence there. If there's a G on one strand, there's a C on the other, there's an A on one strand, there's a T on the other. This is very, very predictable. The PCR process does this over and over again. And every time you do what's called a, uh, a cycle of PCR, you double the amount of DNA that you have. So if you start with a single molecule of DNA and you go through what are called 30 cycles, you get two to the 30th or a billion copies 
of that same DNA molecule. This is all done in a little machine that uh, raises and lowers the temperature and allows the DNA to be replicated. So I can take small amounts of DNA, run it through this PCR process and make billions of copies of it. You then can identify the different DNA molecules. You can separate them by size using a technique called gel electrophoresis. You uh, have this uh, gel, it's actually made out of, uh, it's a plant polysaccharide. You put an electric field on it and the DNA molecules move through the gel and small molecules can travel quickly and large molecules travel more slowly and so you can separate them by size. And then what you can do is create DNA molecules that differ by just a single base as you are sequencing the molecule. So you have all these different DNA molecules, they differ just by a single base in size. You run them through this really long gel, a fancy laser detects which base is which, and you get a little printout that actually tells you what the DNA sequence is. So here is a, an enlargement of that DNA sequence, and you can just read it off what the four nucleotides are in order. This is a haplotype. So you do this for lots and lots and lots of individuals, and you can look at how similar they are. So this is partial sequencers from like 20 different deer. The areas which are in white are identical among all 20 individuals. The areas highlighted in yellow are ones where some individuals have different bases. So a C here, a T there, um, an A here, a G there. And so now, what you can start doing is saying, well, first of all, how many different sequences are there there? And then do some individuals have the same sequence? Can I group them together as having the same haplotype? How similar are they? And I can start looking for how many variations, how similar are the variations, things like that. Uh, so that's kind of how the system works. And so what are the predictions that you would make given what we know about the history of deer on Nantucket. Well, you found the population with two females in 1926. Those two haplotypes should be the most abundant because the herd grew to several hundred before any other additional deer were added. And those haplotypes should be similar to deer from Michigan because that was the source population. They came from some deer farm in Michigan. The later additions to the herd should be a minor component, but they should look like haplotypes found on the New England mainland because those deer brought, were brought from New Hampshire. And finally, the overall genetic diversity, how many different sequences on Nantucket should be low compared to mainland populations because of this founder effect, because it was a population founded by a few individuals. Okay, so here are preliminary results. I haven't quite finished analyzing all of my samples yet, but here's what we've done so far. I've managed to look at uh, 68 different deer, 35 from Nantucket, 27 from the northeastern part of the United States, and that includes like Cape Cod and southeastern Massachusetts, a few from Connecticut and Rhode Island and Maine and um, other parts of New York, and then uh, a few deer that were donated uh, from Michigan. Looking at all of 68 samples, um, 14 haplotypes in like eight haplogroups, and this tree here, it's what's called a, a, a neighbor joining tree. It takes all of those 14 different haplotypes of so different sequences and draws them on a tree depending on how similar they are. So let me explain what's going on here. So for example, here is a, um, a haplotype that was found in Nantucket and Massachusetts mainland and Connecticut. And here is another haplotype from Rhode Island, and they differ 
by a single base. Here's another um, haplotype also from uh, Massachusetts that's very sim fairly simple. Um, here's a haplotype from Nantucket that's fairly similar to one from Michigan. The closer they are on this tree, the more similar they are. Clearly, these haplotypes here look very different than those haplotypes there. They have a branching point on the tree much further back. We look at some of this part in more detail just to make the uh, point here. Deer on Nantucket and deer in Michigan share haplotypes. In particular, this haplotype here found on Nantucket is identical to a deer from Michigan. Here's one from Nantucket that differs from a deer in Michigan by a, a single nucleotide out of 700. So, and these two haplotypes uh, that are similar to or identical to ones from Michigan account for 95%, more than 95% of the sequences from Nantucket. So most of the deer on Nantucket look like deer from Michigan in terms of their mitochondrial DNA. And then there is a sequence that I found uh, a couple times on Nantucket that I also found in Massachusetts on the mainland and in Connecticut which is similar to another one, very similar to one from Rhode Island, and then another one from Massachusetts and Maine. What's interesting about this is, is a couple of things. First of all, this is a sequence which is rare on Nantucket, but similar to the New England mainland. But also the sequence on Nantucket has three copies of that 75 base pair repeat that I mentioned earlier. Although some of the other sequences like um, this one here um, only has two copies of the repeat. And this one also only has two copies of the repeat. So that's a whole other interesting story itself. But what it does show is that at least some of the deer, a small number of them, have sequences typical of the New England mainland, which is also what we expected. This is just a, a picture of one of those electrophoresis gels showing that the DNA, if you're really interested in this kind of stuff, really does come in two size classes. This is the typical shorter piece. This piece, which ran a little bit slower, is 75 base pairs long. That's just because I like to show pictures of gels. Okay, so the other thing that we find is that genetic diversity on Nantucket is low, as we predicted. So. Here are data in this part of the table here from um, the work of my students. And this is published data from a very large uh, study that was done in Western Canada. Uh, you can measure diversity. This is a measure of haplotype diversity, how many variations and what's their relative frequencies. And you can see that on the mainland, diversity fairly high. In Michigan, diversity fairly high. Western Canada, diversity fairly high, all really very close to each other. On Nantucket, half as much, much less genetic diversity, which is again, what you expect from the founder effect. Okay, so in conclusion, most of the deer on Nantucket have haplotypes that look like they came from Michigan. And a few deer on Nantucket um, look like they share sequences uh, with deer from the mainland and mitochondrial diversity on Nantucket is low as we expect from uh, the founder effect. Okay, so what's still to be done? I have additional samples from Southeastern Massachusetts that I have yet to work up. I do have some research students gonna start working on that actually at the beginning of next, we're gonna start this, this semester. There are some other techniques that I'm interested in trying that actually look at DNA rather than mitochondrial DNA to try and track the movement of males. I have not had a chance to do that yet, but I hope in fact, end up with a more complete picture. 
of the population genetics of deer in New England. So first of all, let me thank a whole bunch of people. I want to thank uh, Dr. Brian Connolly, who is now at Eastern Connecticut State University. He used to be at Framingham State. He's the guy who said, who first asked me about deer on Nantucket. I want to thank uh, Dr. Sarah Boyce and also Seth Engelberg from the Linda Loring Nature Foundation who helped with sample collection and logistics on Nantucket. Um, Steve Wright uh, from Mass Division of Fish and Wildlife and Connor Fleming, a, also Mass Division of Fish and Wildlife, a former student of Framingham State. Um, a number of other people who donated samples and uh, money from the Framingham State Center for Excellence in Learning, Teaching and Scholarship and Service who bought me reagents and materials. I also want to thank these undergraduate students over the last uh, five years, there are about 20 of them who have worked on this project with me. And that is what I know about white-tailed deer on Nantucket. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Rick, so much. Um, I, this is the one part about Zoom lectures I don't love is we can't clap for you. It gets really quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for that, that really interesting talk. I think you really led us through understanding about the genetic techniques that you used. And, um, and I'm really interested in the fact that we can use modern techniques and data to show that some of our Nantucket lore is true. Um, and, and, and I find that very interesting. Um, I am going to, let's see, if anyone has any questions um, for Rick, you can feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A portion. Um, I have a few questions <laughs> that I wanted to ask. One was, I know that, you know, we talked before we started recording about um, that you were hampered with some of the work because you weren't allowed in your lab for parts of 2020. And so there's still more work to be done. Um, I'm, I know from some of the names on this attendee list that we have several hunters in this, in this group and other people. Are you looking for more genetic material or are you working through the material that you already have? Truthfully, I'm still trying to get through the material that I have. Um, uh, the mass fish and wildlife, uh, being able to actually collect samples from their deer hunter check stations was a, was very generous on their part. And the fact that it was a former student who was running the check stations really helped as well. But uh, yeah, it, it, I think as, as generous as people, and people have been amazingly generous about this, and I really want to thank them. Um, but I think we've got pretty much all we can handle. Good to know. Um, we do have one question. Um, that was um, early on in your talk. Uh, so, you know, this may be, this is kind of maybe outside the realm of what the talk was about, but um, do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing uh, to shoot deer under the predator deer law as far as tick-borne illnesses are concerned and now possibly COVID? So I know you mentioned you weren't a wildlife biologist. I'm interested to hear in your work with deer what you think about this. So, um... I'm gonna just duck that question because okay. <laughs> I don't know enough about deer management. I truly don't. I don't know. Um, uh, what little I do know tells me that it's a complicated question and that um, it's complicated in terms of um, population control, but it's also complicated in terms of how um, the politics and how people feel about um, various kinds of, of management methods. Uh, so I'm going to not touch that at all. I do appreciate what you were saying in the very beginning, though, about work like yours and looking at genetic relationships between, um, you know, pop different populations of deer. You can look at, you know, how disease vectors may be spread, right? You were talking, you kind of Led with yeah. some of that, so it's interesting to think about where our deer are coming from and where maybe our deer are going, I guess. <laughs> I don't know if they're yeah. going anywhere. As far as I can tell, your deer aren't going anywhere. Right. <laughs> and as far as I can tell, they aren't getting to the island unless someone brings them. Right. So there was a, there was a question um, in the Q&A um, 
again about if we eat if we if we're eating deer consuming um venison on Nantucket that has been harvested here um are we in danger of any of the infections and specifically this is about tick infections um so here's what I know about that you can't get sick from eating the meat but if you are hunting and then you put yourself perhaps at greater risk of being bitten by a tick. You gotta be bitten by a tick to get one of these tick-borne diseases. Um, so if you are a hunter, or even if you're just out walking in the woods, you do need to look at yourself, check for ticks to make sure that you, you haven't picked up one because they're small and they're sneaky. And, uh, but, but the meat itself um, can't spread the disease. As far as I know, I think that's, I, I'm pretty confident about that. Um, and then uh, Bob is asking about, um, do you know about the deer swimming here from the Cape? So yes, um, the I kind of had a similar question for follow-up of, um, as we get more deer that may be swimming from the Cape or as different, you know, there's you know some, certain parts of the either the Cape or from the Vineyard or from different areas where there's a, a smaller um, swimming area for the deer. They're adding to the population. So have you you know how have you thought about that in your research? Well, I, you know, so here's here's what I thought about that. It can't be a lot. It can't be a lot of deer because mainland type sequences are a very small part of what you see there. Um, it really looks like, like I say, 95% of the herd or more are descended, at least on the maternal side, from those first two deer brought from Michigan. If deer were swimming back and forth a lot, I think it wouldn't look like that. More to the point, for 20 years before that, at least, say, say so, in the early 1900s, people didn't see a deer. As soon as there's one deer brought to the island, people saw that deer over and over again over the next several years. It wasn't like one, one deer couldn't hide. So if there had been deer swing back and forth to the island prior to 1922, you'd have seen them and you didn't see them. So I think the number of deer who actually swim here successfully is, is really, really small, if at all. I think deer swim perhaps to uh, Martha's Vineyard from using the Elizabeth Islands perhaps as a stepping stones or something like that. But I think all the way from what I measured at one time, I think it's minimum distance was like eight or nine miles, which is a long way for a deer to swim. Deer can swim four or five miles. They've been shown to swim several miles, but I think it's a long way. But more to the point, you'd have seen them. They'd have been here before. Excellent. All right. So any are there any other questions as we're kind of wrapping up here? I think um let's see. Right. Well, um, if there's no other questions for right now, I'm just gonna make once again thank Rick for being here tonight. Thank you, Dr. Beckwith, for sharing your knowledge and sharing your project. And I love these types of projects too that really involve undergraduate students in hands-on research, answering real, real research questions that we don't have answers to yet. So I applaud you for that as well. Um, and um, we have lots of thank yous coming in <laughs> on our chat. Um, and if you are, for those of you still on the, um, on the Zoom right now, you know, keep in mind we have additional talks every month um, up until May for Science Pub. And our next talk is in February is actually about um, some tick-borne illnesses and looking at, um, sorry, I don't have my notes in front of me. So February 7th is our next Science Pub. You can check out the Linda Laurie Nature Foundation website for how to register. Um, that's llnf.org. So Rick, thank you again so much for being here tonight. Um, and Thanks again. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Great. Right. Um, I am going to stop recording. Yes.